for me to accelerate what we do by finding domain expertise and, you know, building my network, right? Which, you know, I, I can build a much better business together than I could just doing it in my own silo. Welcome to the Building to Scale podcast, where we bring real entrepreneur stories that showcase the challenges and successes in building and scaling an entrepreneurial business. Our host, Jeff Chastain, is a business transformation coach with Admentis, where he coaches business leaders and their teams with a proven set of principles and tools, helping them gain clarity in and get more of what they want from their business. Make sure to stick around until the end of the show, and we will reveal how you can become our next guest. Hello, everybody. Jeff Chastain here with another episode of the Building to Scale podcast, where I get the opportunity really to speak with entrepreneurial business leaders and influencers really hearing their stories of both success and challenges over the years as they've grown and scaled their businesses today to where it is today. So today's guest with me, I have Noah Zandon out of uh, Austin, Texas area with Quantified Communications. So first off, Noah, thanks for joining us for a few minutes and taking a few minutes out of your day. My pleasure. So start off with me, tell me a little bit more about yourself and about Quantified Communications. Who who are you here? Sure. So, uh, I am a uh, first-time entrepreneur. I'm based in Austin, Texas. Uh, my background is in finance. So I've always been a numbers, math, science guy, studied econometrics in college, worked on Wall Street for a few years, got a job doing finance on the West Coast for a, a, a fantastic private equity firm. But uh, my father growing up started a business in our living room. And so I, I saw him do that. He had good success with it. He took it public. And, uh, you know, I was sitting in finance, loved my job, but was always saying, I think there's something more. And I, I love technology. And I saw the emotional attachment that he had to running his own business and being his own boss. And, and I, I kind of said, I want that. And so I, uh, I took the plunge after I got my MBA and uh, decided to start a business really from my graduate school dorm room. And uh, nine years later, here I am. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's it's definitely a difference because I, I know I'm the same way that I was corporate America for quite some time and just it, it, it just turned into a grind kind of thing. It's like, okay, that, that little bit of an entrepreneurial kind of edge out there saying, okay, there, there's something different, something better you can go. So that's, that's a lot of people's story right there. Yeah. So yeah. how did you go from financial world to, and I guess for that matter, tell us a little bit more about quantified communications and be on the, the software side or how that works. Yeah. You know, so I, I knew I wanted to start a business. Uh, and so I, I thought a lot about what are the problems that I had seen in my own development. You know, I was fortunate in finance to work for fantastic firms, right? I've been working at Lehman Brothers and Deutsche Bank, and they were very invested in my growth and my development. But as I got started to get into my career, I realized that they were training me really well on how to use spreadsheets, right? How to do how to do the math, how to do the accounting, how to do the financial modeling. But if I looked at what the people with the much nicer offices than mine were doing, they were doing relationship building right? They were building trust and selling and fundraising and all of these skills that that I was really worried, Jeff, that I wasn't being trained how to do. Yeah. And so I saw my career, you know, I saw the next steps of my career, right? I was learning how to be an individual contributor. I was learning how to do the math and the, and the numbers part, but I wasn't learning how to lead an organization. And I got really worried about that because I said, in my, in my future, I want to lead an organization. Where can I learn those skills? And I realized that one of the biggest gaps that I had personally was my own communication skills, right? My ability to persuade and influence and lead. And so I tried to find ways to solve it, couldn't find a way to solve it and decided to start a business to solve really that problem that I saw for myself. And you know, as I started doing more research for, for a lot of my peers that we wanted to lead companies, but no one was really teaching us how. Makes sense. And yeah, that's, that's where a lot of the business ideas kind of come from of just experiences you've owned got. So- yeah. Tell me a little bit more about quantified communications itself. What, what are you got? What are you? What are you bringing to the table? How are you basically building those leaders or helping teach those leaders? Yeah, so we're a behavioral science firm, and what that means is we have understood what does it mean for someone to be an effective communicator. What does it mean for them to be an effective leader in the way that they speak, the way that they present, the way that other people perceive them, and we help people develop that capability. And uniquely, what really sets us apart is we do that with science and data and evidence as opposed to kind of advice and opinion. And so what we have built is a data-driven understanding of how do people perceive you and what behaviors drive that perception. And then we teach people those behaviors. So we give you feedback on how you're perceived. We give you guidance on how to improve that perception. And then we stay with you along the way as you develop that. 
and show you the improvements in the outcomes that we we know that people want to achieve as they as they strive to be leaders and great leaders of organizations. We do that in a, mostly through software now. When I started the business, we did it very manually and we've learned over time how to automate and scale it. Yep, and that's the key really. So I would say, I think the company you said was about eight years old now? Yeah, we're going on year nine soon. So kind of going back in history there, obviously we, we figured out kind of how you jumped into it, but what's what's your role look like or what's your role changed from eight years ago to, to where it is now today? Yeah. You know, when I when I started the business, right, I mean, I didn't have a lot of domain expertise in the field of communications, in the field of skill based learning. And so really, as I started it, I was kind of a consultant. I, I knew the domain I wanted to work in, but I basically said, I'm going to see what people are willing to bring me in to do. And that was really a way to sort of bridge what I'd call the initial research that we knew we wanted to do. We knew we wanted to start with data. We knew we wanted to do behavioral modeling. And, and so I invested the first two years of my own time basically saying I'm going to intentionally consult and do what people ask me to do, bring my mathematical analytical modeling brain to the to this field, listen, and also intentionally invest in building some sort of database or IP that allows me to learn about the industry and start creating some unique value to the people that we're talking to. First two years investing then we really started to open up shops, start to build technology and start to intentionally move the business forward after two years of investment. Okay. So it was that, it sounds like that first two years was pretty much just you or did you, were you starting to build a team at that point or what, what, how, where did you get to the point of building a team and, and what kind of triggered that of the, Hey, I, this needs to be more than just me potentially. You know, I'm fortunate my co-founder, who's also my father, so happy to talk about family business dynamics, has an evaluation research PhD. And so uh, I'd like to say I was doing a lot of the work and getting fantastic counsel and advice on how to do the work from someone who has done it a ton of times and knows how to do it the right way. And so it was really the two of us that started it, me doing a lot of the work, him, him giving me great counsel and opening up his network to me, which allowed me to kind of get a head start and get going. And then as we felt like we started getting enough traction, we were able to, to hire folks, mostly initially on the research and technical side as we started building up more of the, the foundation for what we wanted to achieve. Yeah, so your your father's actually, I forget, I remember seeing the title on the, the website. So he's actually almost more reporting to you, isn't he, from a, a structure standpoint? I'd, I'd love to say that. Someone recently <laughs> asked if he was my brother, which I think is the best compliment he's ever received in his life. That was actually my first thought when I saw it on the website. So <laughs> there you go. See, now he gets it twice. Um, you know, he's our chief data scientist, but but more importantly, he's our executive chairman. So uh, okay. I, I definitely, you know, from a formal board reporting perspective, report up to him. Uh, but he's been fantastic. You know, I, I think one of the things I respect the most about him is he, he's had great success in his career and in his business, and now he's happy to enable mine. And, you know, one of the best things I'm fortunate on is, you know, I don't have, he's not competing with me, right? He's enabling yeah. me. And I think that, that dynamic is incredibly important when I think about what makes for a good board member or a good advisor is his, my success is his success. And that dynamic is so clean that it's wonderful. And it's been a wonderful working relationship together. Well, good, because yeah, you you hear the gamut with obviously families, but especially taking that into business and, and things like that. So it's there's been some obviously I've heard that have been great successes and others that have been challenges, put it that way. But um, especially when it comes to succession planning and growth and things like that, so it's good to hear things are working out well. They are, and I think uniquely, I didn't inherit a business from him, right? Like I started the business with him, and that was there was a lot of intention to that. And you know that created a dynamic that we could set up intentionally from the start, as opposed to him wanting to pass the business to me at a certain stage. That that's not what's going on here. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's uh, I can see that. So you mentioned uh, advisory kind of capabilities. I saw that you have advisory board listed out on your website. What? How did that come about, or how, how does that work in in terms of your business model? You know. So much of taking the step to start a business takes courage, right? I mean, it takes confidence and courage and an appropriate degree of maybe conviction or blinding uh, vision. And uh, early on, uh, I was trying to find my own courage to do it. And, uh, you know, I, I met a fantastic guy out on the West Coast named Davis Maston. I, I now call him my uncle. I call him Uncle Davis. And he had started a business when he was 27. 
And so, you know, he had kind of gone through that, you know, he, he's now retired and has just had a fantastic, amazing career, remarkable, creative entrepreneur. And I started getting his advice and getting his counsel. And I just said, you know, Davis, you're, you're such a mentor to me. You're like an uncle. How do I formalize our working arrangement? And that really inspired me to start an advisory group and really think about a lot of people talk about like a personal board of directors, right? And, and they were invested in me, but also in the company. And putting that group together was just a remarkable accelerator for me because I could find people that had the domain expertise I didn't have. I could find people that had the technical expertise I didn't have. And I would recruit them to help me. And I, you know, I could never afford them, right? I could yeah. never pay their salaries. But if I could convince them to believe in the purpose and mission of, of me and what I wanted to achieve and what the company wanted to achieve, then I could solicit their help and guidance. And it's just been a remarkable way for me to accelerate what we do by finding domain expertise and you know building my network, right? Which you know I, I can build a much better business together than I could just doing it in my own silo. Yeah, and that's what a lot of entrepreneurs I've, I find, especially once you kind of get to that top of the, the company or start at the top of the company, it can tend to be a, a lonely place. It's like, okay, where do I turn for advice? Where do I turn for expertise? And in a lot of ways, everybody below you is looking up saying, hey, he's he, she's supposed to have all the answers here. And rarely do we. Yeah, so and, and you know, it's also very different to have an advisory board and a formal board, right? So, you know, I think that's an important nuance for me is I have a great board. And my board is also very invested in my success, but I can treat an advisor. I can go to an advisor with a complete vulnerability and a problem that I may not want to bring to my board of directors because, you know, they have a fiduciary responsibility that's just different. So yeah. uh, it also allows people that may have a conflict to be on the board uh, continue to be involved. So this is not one that I typically hear from smaller companies of having that advisory board concept. So. Can we dive in a little bit more tactical into it as to how you put it together or how you brought those people involved? How do they, how do you work with them? Is it more of a team environment, group environment, or is it just one-on-one -on -one kind of network? What is it really, what's, what's the tactical side of it really look like? Yeah, it's always evolving, right? And a lot of what I'm trying to figure out is how do I best uh, tap into their knowledge and their expertise and their guidance, but also be really respectful of their time you know, almost all of them are, you know, doing amazing things in their own careers. And so how do I best balance that? You know, the, a lot of it comes down to finding people at the right moment and the right moment in their availability and willingness to help. Right. And so a little bit of it up front is kind of like dating, like, you know, Hey, let's, let's figure out what this working arrangement is. Do you want to do a monthly call? Do you want to just check in as needed? Do you want to work with me? Do you want to speak with the other advisors and kind of get together as a group and a lot of that I've just been calibrating over the years. And, and I would say there's not one model that works. It's kind of dependent. You know, I have some people like Davis, I've had a monthly call with him for eight years, right? And that's a long relationship where there's a lot of trust and guidance build. And, you know, I can bring him anything. Uh, you know, there's others that I'd say slightly more formalized, you know, people who, you know, just want to get an email or just kind of want to give a counsel or an introduction if I see that they're connected to somebody. Uh, we also have a variety of kind of models of formal involvement that they have. So, you know, there's formal advisors that have some ownership in the business versus, you know, kind of more informal people that just provide counsel and, and support and assistance as needed. Uh, and again, it's kind of willing, kind of dependent on their willingness to dedicate time uh, and the calibration of the relationship that we have. Makes sense. So you've mentioned uh, vision and, and values and such several times and just the way you're dealing with these people. Talk to me about what uh, vision means to to you and to your your company there. Yeah, so you know, there's there's vision, mission, and and values, right? And I, I really think about all three very carefully as I run a business because you know, especially now that kind of this working in the office thing has been disrupted for technology companies like us. You know, why are people going to want to work on this, right? Like, what is it that that what is it that brings us all together, right? I mean. It, it sort of, it used to be, call it 50 years ago, that we wanted a job, right? We wanted a job to support our family. Now people seem, you know, certainly the level of talent that I'm lucky enough to work with, these people can get a job anywhere. And so they want to work on what we're doing because of certain reasons. And those reasons tend to be our vision, our purpose, our values, the unique thing we are trying to achieve. You know, I'm trying to do something that's never been done before. And that that type of vision is very inspiring for a certain type of person. 
and really, really motivating for the type of people that we that I get to work with and that are on my team. So, you know, we're we're very explicit with our vision and our mission. Uh, and, you know, we're also pretty explicit with our strategy and the execution of that. And we, we absolutely believe in our values. And one of the things that I like to say is, you know, decisions are made based upon our values. So who we hire, who we promote, who we let go. We really think carefully about the values. We, one of the things that we do uniquely at our organization is we have uh, each employee can give two other employees a recognition award throughout the year. And when they do that, you know, it's, it's great. It's like a gift card to one of your favorite places. And when they do it, they actually talk about what value did the person exhibit in, in giving that award. So it's not just, you know, I like Noah, I want to give Noah this, right? It's Noah demonstrated the value of collaboration through this. And I want to recognize and award that, uh, which is a great way to kind of really bring our values to practice in our organization. Yeah, I like that because it makes it a lot more tangible. So it's, I, I'm looking again at the website, saw that you've got the, uh, I can't remember, five or six core values listed up there. But you mentioned that it's not just website material, which is a lot of times what we'll see with, with companies kind of a thing. You're actually utilizing it in managing people, things like that as well. We really are. And that's that's really important to me because otherwise it, it just becomes nice words on a paper that it feels like somebody else wrote for you. Yeah, yeah. So Talk to me, obviously, um, I know, I know you're, it was, I think it was actually off the careers page of the, the, the jobs page on the website kind of thing. So obviously you're looking at that for new hires and things like that. What does it, um, and the, even the award system you, you talked about using it throughout, is that just through the award system encourage kind of a thing, or do you use it any other ways with your team on, on an ongoing basis? You know, I think one of the most important places that we use it is hiring. Uh, you know, really try to hire people. We want to hire, you know, great diverse perspectives and, and a diverse group of people, but what does align us, right? The glue between us is these values. And if we feel like people don't exhibit those values, I mean, one of the unique ones, right, is objective. So we run on data, not opinions. And if somebody believed that, you know, look, there's an art to this. I don't really like data. I don't really like numbers and math then they might not be as organizationally as strong of a fit because that is an important value to our organization. And we would certainly consider that as to whether or not we selected that person to work at our organization. So go ahead. So, so how do you balance in talking about the hiring or whatever, how do you balance values and such versus skill set? You know, you, you try to get both, which is hard, right? I mean, if, if I think about what makes a good hire, Right. I really think about three things in our hiring model. There's capabilities, there's passion and there's fit. Right. So the capabilities is what you talked about. It's the skills. Does this person have the skills for the job that I need? If, if I'm hiring an engineer, do they understand the code base? Right. Like, can they perform the job? There's passion, which is actually you asked about, you know, mission and vision. Right. Like, do they believe that what we're trying to do right to democratize improved communication is an important vision for the world. And it's something that they can get behind. And then the fit part is the values part, right? So are they a good fit for the role? Are they a good fit for the organization? Are they a good fit for their team and their manager? Because if I can get all three of those things right, then I can bat a little bit higher than average on the success of hiring. And if I can do that, then I can run a more efficient, effective organization. Yeah, makes sense. So. Going back a little bit to our, our earlier conversation and trying to grow and scale the business as you went through, what has what have been some of the challenges or what, what's changed really within your role as you went from a handful of people, I'm trying to, I don't remember if we've talked already on, on how many people, uh, total employees right now, but still as you grew that level and started adding, adding layers, adding complexity, et cetera, to the organization there just in terms of the size. So if you haven't realized yet, I'm a very objective person, right? Like yeah. I like numbers, I like analytics, I like math, and you know I'm trying to help humans be more connective through data. So you know it's a, a part of the way that my brain thinks and the way that I operate is is you know fairly organizationally structured, right? And so you know in in, in response to that question, a lot of what's helped me are like what is the guiding light for our organization and how do I create you know, a bit of consistent and transparent, like systems of management for the org. And, you know, I, I was, I was you know, telling you that we've been on entrepreneurial operating system for about a year, you know, before that, before we discovered it, and actually our, our VP of engineering and VP of product had both come from companies that had used it in the past. So they were, the reason we did it was because they, 
strongly recommended it as something that we should consider because they saw what we were already doing, which was, you know, some something like a, a handmade, a homemade version of it yeah. and just said, hey, there's there's some additional learnings that you can bring in. But, you know, we've always had pretty objectifiable goals, measurement against those goals. You know, the OKR system or whatever you want to call it has always been sort of a guiding light for us because I think it does create a view of transparency and honesty in the way that we approach managing the organization. A lot of my path, Jeff, has been learning how to do a good job with that, like creating the appropriate goals, consistent management, guidance, transparency, coaching, performance optimization against a system that, <clears throat> that is fairly quantitative. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously, welcome to dive into to EOS there, but I'm curious. So it's what was your draw really to EOS? Was it just the, the systematized kind of model or what, what was what made you turn that corner to say, OK, what we're doing right now is is good, but this system might be able to bring us something better or bring us something more trust it was trust you know I, when two of my senior leaders say noah you really should consider this i have a lot of trust in my team and if they say hey this is great i've really enjoyed working on it and i think it, it could add value here then you know i had trust in them to pursue it and then you know trust and test right and we tested it we liked it and brought it in as an organization so i'm curious you said you're just barely into a year of it but what 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 kind of changes or what kind of impact have you seen over that year you know, it's it, it has taken us a while to calibrate, right? I mean, I, I would say the the goals that we the rocks that we have and the goals that we had in the first quarter, you know, we had to learn kind of how many to have, what should we achieve, what should we not achieve, how how high do we shoot versus how realistic should we be. Um, but you know, I think what's really nice for my senior team is it's created an organizational consistency and an organizational pattern of leadership that I think is really nice for people. And yeah. so, you know, I think the the fact that it's a system, the fact that we have someone external that helps us facilitate the system has really helped me create, you know, an organizational management system that I think people appreciate the consistency and transparency of it. I also think for me as a leader, and I, I talked to a lot of other friends who are business leaders about this, like the, the freedom that you have when you can kind of say, am I a visionary or am I an integrator with my role instead of trying to be both, which I think is where uh, a lot of people struggle. The freedom that that <clears throat> that that has for me to to decide kind of what do I want to do, what kind of leader do I want to be, has been really nice for me. Yeah, no, it's it's a challenge for sure. If you're trying to straddle both straddle both those seats and sit in both of them, that yeah, it's that's a in a lot of ways it's almost an internal personality kind of conflict. That like you said, the 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 integrators are the much more organized, much more data driven, systems wise versus the visionary is typically a lot more dreamer and doesn't enjoy the data necessarily as much. And if you try to stay in both of those, then yeah, that's, that's a, that's a hard thing for an entrepreneur to honestly, that's, that's where a lot of them kind of burn out is what I've found over time is just like, okay, this is, it's not quite as fun anymore. It's, it's like, okay, there's, there's too much work and too much other stuff going on that this is not really the dream I had of whatever my passion was is now I'm having to do management. Now I'm having to manage schedules, manage budgets, manage all this stuff. And I want to go dream. I want to go do my passion. So yeah, it's, yeah. that's, can be a challenge, but at the same time, you coming from a numbers background, I figured you probably fit more the integrator side or are you? Well, it, it, that's actually team? been a unique challenge for me, right? Because I have the skills of an integrator, right? I mean, I have an MBA. I like numbers. I like systems. I like management, but I always wanted to be a visionary, right? I mean, I started this business because I had a vision and I wanted to see that vision through. And that's been, you know, why I keep doing it, uh, you know, the, the results that we're able to have and the behaviors that we see and the happiness from our customers is obviously what fuels it. But like, I, I want to execute my vision. And so I had that tension, right? Of, <clears throat> I have the skills to be an integrator. And you know, at another organization that I'm not running, I would probably be a pretty natural integrator. But as the CEO, I need to paint a vision. And so yeah. my growth has been towards that visionary component. And, uh, and also, learning how to delegate and let go of the integration part that I can do. But if I get help on, I can grow more into the role of a visionary. Yeah. And I think that's really one of the keys to leadership period, even beyond EOS is saying, Hey, there's a core sweet spot that this is my, where I can best provide the most value kind of a thing there. And even though I can do a bunch more beyond that core sweet spot, if I can hand that stuff off, one, it'll help the company grow a lot, but it'll, like you said, even help you grow more at it. And that's that's a hard lesson for a lot of entrepreneurs because we started the business. It's our baby kind of a thing. We, we want to make sure everything's done right all the time, but we can't do everything ourselves once yeah. it gets to that level. Yeah, at a certain point, I should stop taking the trash out, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's probably somebody else that could do that. So um, looking more on the, the forward-looking side, what, obviously, I guess I'm curious with the, the whole behavioral changes and stuff you're looking at, communication side, obviously we've been somewhat locked down at least for the last eight plus months now. A lot of communication's gone online with Zoom and stuff like that. What do you see anything different basically going forward from a, a communication standpoint, from an employee engagement kind of standpoint, anything like that? How do you, how do you see anything different going forward? You know, if I if I look at the pandemic, right, like the, the first chapter of it for organizations was like, oh, my God, are we going to survive? Right. And and I would say that was for our organization as well as for our clients. Right. And so the the initial curve was like, how do we just set up the logistics of work? Right. Like, how do we communicate to our internal employees? How do we communicate to our current customers? Right. Like, how can we survive? And then it, the second chapter has been more, OK, like we're surviving, hopefully. Uh, how do we how do we improve on it? How do we thrive? You know, we did a big piece of research with Harvard, and we found out that people are actually pretty happy with some of the virtual communication that they're doing. You know, we we miss the water cooler, so to speak, and the small talk, but uh, the frequency in which and the ease of which we can have a virtual meeting has freed up a lot of people. Uh, and for organizations like ours that already had people that were remote that were in other parts of the country, it's so equalizing for them. And so. You know, so much of what we've done is we were in that same group of like, can we survive? Then how do we help people thrive for our organization as well as for our clients? You know, I kind of mentioned at the beginning, we are a digital solution to improving someone's communication. We help people connect and we do that through a digital software. So we really are uniquely positioned to help people in this remote environment create better connections, better present themselves better you know imp better influence through digital mediums so for us it's been exciting to see the the broader adoption of that and frankly people's satisfaction over time grow as they realize that they can do a lot of the human relationship building the connection stuff through virtual communication yeah that's that's the one thing i keep looking at as a, a blessing on this is that where we are technology it's like if we had gone through this even five years ago kind of a thing there it, it would have been so much more difficult just from from where we are from a technology standpoint these days yeah and believe it or not i mean we, we did a lot of research on this people are happy with it they don't want to go back you know i mean over over 80 percent of people feel like they're going to have this a similar number of virtual meetings once social distance guidelines are lifted yeah so this is here to stay. And I think it's in a lot of ways, that's really nice for a lot of people. Oh, it's like you said, from the productivity standpoint, the days of, I don't say I'm up in Dallas area, heavy Metroplex, you're in, you're in Austin, you go spend an hour drive just to get to a meeting, have coffee or whatever, another hour drive kind of thing back. Now you can do it through Zoom and it's still not quite the same, but at the same time, saved you two hours right there just yeah. in, in transportation time. So it's- Not to mention when you fly across the country for like a half hour meeting. Right. Yeah. You're going the night before you're staying in a hotel, you're doing a ton of travel, a big environmental impact. And you can now do that over Zoom. It's you know, it's great for a ton of reasons. Yeah. And, and a cost savings right there, too. I know I've talked with a lot in the, the legal industry that's like, OK, I can multitask now or I can do shorter things and you're not having to pay me for the drive time to the deposition or whatever like that. So I think it's going to impact a lot of industries really across the board. It'll be it'll be interesting to see what what a new year looks like for sure. Yeah, agreed. So I, I know, obviously, with your background in EOS and everything here, you've got longer term plans. What's what's the what's the future? The rose colored glasses, the, the the fortune telling look like for your company here going out. You know, so much of our of our vision from day one, right, was to <clears throat> to take something that has been this very human expertise. There's only a small number of people in the world that could walk into the room with you and make you a remarkable communicator, and we wanted to take that and democratize it, and we wanted to do that by making it a science. Right. So making it something that can be tested, measured, done you know, at scale and then using software to distribute that knowledge at scale. So essentially to democratize what only a few experts in the world knew how to do remarkably well. And that's our path. Right. And so our path has been how do we <clears throat> how do we learn it and then how do we build it and then how do we share it. Right. So we've learned it. We're going to continue to learn it. We learn every day how to do it better. Well, we build it, right? We have a team of technology folks and amazing product folks and um, data science folks to help us do it. And then so much of it for me in the future and certainly 2021 is how do we share it, right? How do we make more people aware of what we do? 
and the value that we can bring their organization, help their sales team be more productive, help them sell more, help them reach quota, help new people learn faster what the great people at their organization do. And <clears throat> for us, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? Because it was a domain expertise problem, then it was a software problem, and now it's really more of a marketing problem. And as I look at my 2021 plan, a lot of it is how do I get the word out? No, makes perfect sense. Yeah. So going back and, and looking at where you were, whatever it was, like I said, six, eight years ago, starting this to where you are now in your journey, what's kind of that best tip or strategy that says, hey, if I only knew this or if I had only done this originally, things might be easier or might be might be different now? It's a great question. You know, I, I think <clears throat> I was fortunate when I started that I knew other people knew more than I did, right? I wasn't blind to the fact that I had a lot to learn. Uh, I think the biggest lesson that I've gotten is despite like all of the learnings and all of the access and all of the things that I can do on any day, my job is prioritization, right? My job is to step into step in every day and say, what do I want to achieve? What's the best use of my time? What's the best use of my organizationals? you know, my organization's capabilities and really figuring out a good system for that, both personally as well as for the organization has been one of the biggest things I've had to learn because, you know, there's fires every day, right? There's the thing at the top of my inbox that says, you know, Noah, you need to go do this. But sometimes that's, you know, $1 an hour, $10 an hour work that can get my attention, but may not move my organization forward and I think <clears throat> learning a system for myself and for the organization to accomplish that has really enabled us to move at a different degree of speed and execution. Yeah, uh, it's, it goes back to the, like I said, the entrepreneurial kind of mindset of, hey, I can do everything. I was talking to somebody the other day. He's like, yeah, the temptation is still there to go log into the support mail email box and make sure we don't have any customer issues. Like, that's not my job now as being the CEO. I, I hire people to do that. So, yeah, that's yeah. That's a consistent challenge I hear from a lot of entrepreneurs is trying to step back and really get to that that delegation mindset when it's like I could just go do that and I, and I fight that regularly myself kind of a thing. I'm I'm not, I'm not immune to that even when I try to coach others with that. So yeah, and especially for me, right? I mean, I had had a lot of people management jobs, so I didn't I had to learn all those skills on the fly, <clears throat> and that learning has been you know remarkably enabling for me, but a, but a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's lots of ways I'd, I'd love to go with this, but don't want to turn this into a two hour interview here. So uh, tell me a little bit more or tell more listeners a little bit more about the company in terms of if they want to learn more about you or about the company, where can they go find some information? Sure. The, the best place to start is our website, quantified.ai. <clears throat> uh, you know, you can go and explore what we do for organizations, for senior executives, the value that we bring and the way that we help people present themselves and communicate more effectively to their target audiences. Uh, we also publish a ton of research. And so there's a section of our website where you can download those resources and see everything from eBooks to blogs to studies. Uh, and if you Google us, you can find the research that we share with, with organizations like Harvard. Uh, and finally, I most recently wrote a book. Uh, the book is called Insights into Influence and you can find it on Amazon or the influencebook.com. And it's uh, what I did was I put together 20 of the most interesting people that I had met uh, after doing this for eight years. And I interviewed him and I said, <clears throat> you know, share what, share how you've built your influence, share the, the, like the secrets that you have behind that. And I'm sharing that with the world. So uh, whether you go to our website or you go check out the book, that's really the best way to start learning what we do and how we do it and our unique things that we've learned to enable people. Great. Yeah. I'll make sure we got that, those links right here below on the, on the video here. So really good information. I appreciate uh, you're taking a few minutes out of your time and it's good to get to know you. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Building to Scale podcast. If you would like to share your entrepreneurial business growth story, please visit buildingtoscale.com slash guest. If you got something out of this interview, would you do both us and our guest a favor and share it on your social media accounts? Don't forget to hit subscribe in your player so that you don't miss any future episodes and make sure to reach out to Jeff Chastain on any of the major social media networks or check us out at admentis.com.